thank the mighty Jesus. May your will be done upon this. All in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope we are doing fine as usual. Maybe I should be standing there because some are just hearing a voice. They don't see anyone. <laughs> they don't see anyone. Okay. Mm. Yesterday we have we had a little chat, uh, a little chat which is about an hour uh, on the on the topic or the theme of the power of prayer. Like, um, what exactly we receive when we keep on praying, having a prayer for life? What is it that is a package that is following us, you know, as we are continuing to pray? So, it, it is a lot to say. We can speak about this topic the whole week, like, even the whole month, and not even exhaustive, because from Genesis 1, verse 1 to Revelation 22, 21 every verse somehow mentions Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ we find prayer for lifestyle. Jesus Christ prayed I don't know how many times in a day prayed in the mount even the prayers in the day were not sufficient. He even didn't sleep at night just to dedicate his life to prayer. So I know some of us are praying only during the day and we even find that we have prayed a lot but Jesus Christ found it that if praying during the day only is not even enough. You have to pray even at night. And at times, you have to go even to the mountains and be alone in a secret place and pray. With us, we can go to the mountains, but it's not a must. Doesn't mean if you don't go to a mountain, you are not a prayerful person. A mountain just keeps you to be in a secret place where there is no noise and so forth. If you can do that in your room, it's fine. You can do it as long as you are in a secret place where there is no much noise where because noise disturbs you know? imagine you are praying and you hear three gunshots wah, wah, wah. and you're about to ask something important you even forget <laughs> and start interceding for the someone <laughs> who the bullet, the bullet will meet you know? or you hear a car crashing it's not easy to continue praying even in the mountain there are those times you know? so it's hard to pray um, when there's a noise. There are those times you're in a mountain and I remember some testimonies of people. One man said I was coming from prayer and I met a, an anaconda, a big snake. And there was no way I could go back. It's a river behind me and there's no way on the sides. I have to meet this thing. Like I have to pass where it is standing and it's approaching. The man said he started praying with his eyes open. So, you notice that? <laughs> was he noticed if I close my eyes? <laughs> I might find myself in the small intestines of a snake. <laughs> so that, that prayer was answered because he came back alive. <laughs> so there, there are those times you, know, you are praying and in a mountain, big mountain, and you are hearing a chicken. Hey, man, chicken in a mountain. You, want, you will be tempted you know, to open your eyes and check. When you check, there is no chicken here. There are some guys, and I'm telling you about testimonies I've had, people I know. There are some that were in a river going, going to pray, you know, just to get into a river. And they need a quiet place. 
And when they open their eyes, there were three lions outside the river. Three lions, real lions. And the guys prayed and prayed for hours. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't go out, you know. And there, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. Some you are going to pray on a mountain. When you are passing, you find a house, full house in a mountain. When you are coming back, that house is not there. I'm telling you about the things I have actually heard from people I know. Those are testimonies, living testimonies. And to show that their testimonies, one person tells you this, and the other one tells you the same thing. And they were both there. So that shows that it's a reality. So when you go to the mountain, there's a different kind of challenges when you go there. You are in your room, there's a kind of challenge. You are praying and your mother says, Hey, Tabo, we are here somehow. And you are deep in prayer, <laughs> interceding for the family, and they are calling you to come and cook. It's not easy. So we just need a quiet, a quiet time, you know, in prayer. And the reason, okay, I think now the someone is taking another direction. I wanted to proceed from yesterday, the power of prayer, uh, to talk about more of the things that are there, the requirements of um, the prayer, the prayer for life. To have that power in prayer. Because there are some people who pray and pray and pray. Some will, you'll hear them saying, I, I have prayed for five years. I remember in the trains where, when I used to share in the trains, some guys will say, you know, I've been praying for a long time and don't seem to get answers. What's wrong? Where, 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 where am I missing it? And there are requirements for you to have a powerful prayer. As we call it, a powerful prayer, but it's all about power in prayer. Okay, let's let's read the first verse. Um, it's just proceeding from yesterday. Uh, first verse is First Thessalonians chapter five, verse seventeen. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse seventeen. Verse seventeen and eighteen. Chapter five. Thessalonians. The letter to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. If someone found it, please just let us hear it. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 17. Today without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not overseas. Amen. Yeah, that's, that's well fine. So verse, verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. It says, never stop praying in another place. Like, pray continually. So that's the first requirement uh, to having power in prayer or to having a prayerful life that is having power inside. So you have to pray without ceasing. So if you are praying and you are fasting and all those things, you fast for a week and pray for a week and stop, the next week you have stopped, you are likely to lack that power. Because all you are doing is to visit the reputation for prayer. So we ought to pray without ceasing. And what it means, it doesn't mean that you are praying every second. Like you're no longer going out to check your neighbors and to give to the needy and so forth. What it means is never stop being prayerful. Anything you are thinking about in your mind, pray about it. Anything that you think you'll be doing tomorrow, pray about it. Anything that is troubling you, pray about it. The same guy who wrote, or the same brother who wrote this uh, verse, Paul, he also spoke, he said, give care for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, make your request be known unto God. He says, don't care for anything, anything that comes to your heart. Don't say, but this I can't ask God of it. This I can't say to God because, ah, what, do, what will God say? Speak to him with everything, anything. Ask, tell him whatever you can do. But the essence of it is to remain prayerful. Because if you don't remain prayerful, we end up sticking to one type of prayer. Always pray, maybe the prayer of forgiveness. Every time. Every time you go back to God is when you are feeling guilty that you have sinned. Every time. When you don't feel guilty, you don't go and pray. That now is not right. Because you are praying only one kind of prayer. You are not asking anything. You are not interceding for anyone. All you do, oh Father, please, I have wronged you. Please, I will repent. You get up. Tomorrow you come back. I have sinned again, Lord. Please forgive me. You get up. Tomorrow you come back again. All your life you have been praying one type of a prayer. So that's not a prayerful life. A prayerful life is when you are including almost all the types of prayers. Prayer of inter uh, intercession. Uh, interceding for others. 
where they are sitting, actually there are people who are gifted at intercession. And how they are, how to see that is, at some point they're just sitting and you think about praying for someone. That is not coming from the devil, it can't, and it will never be, it's coming from God. So you just think about praying for someone, maybe you are just sitting in your room alone, all of a sudden you are thinking about Brother Brandon, and then you start seeing things, maybe you see a car falling, then you start praying, Lord, please protect Brother Brandon. Then later on, I don't know, I have no idea that you prayed for me. I don't even know. And I'm in a car and all of a sudden the brakes fails. Things happen but it remains on the road. What happens? The person who was interceding. That's a, someone who is gifted in intercession. But everyone can intercede. Having a prayer for life. And there's prayer of petition, prayer of thanksgiving. There's some point we just, just, just go to God and thank him. That's all you do. Just thank him. Like Jesus Christ when he blessed the bread. He just said, Lord, thank you. He didn't say, oh Lord, please make this bread to be like this and this and this now. Just said, thank you, Lord. Why? Because the Lord knows the heart. Actually, when you're becoming thankful, one brother said, take it like a father, you know. If your father buys you a phone or your guardian buys you a phone, and you don't thank them, it's very unlikely that they will get you a new one when that one is messed up. Very unlikely. But the minute you say, thank you very much, that touches their heart. Eh? They can't even do more than you will see them, them buying you a screen protector pouch for that phone. But if you don't say thank you, ah, that phone is what they're getting. <laughs> screen protector and all those things, you can keep them for yourself. So the, the word thank you is very important. That's why even to God, we have to say thank you, Lord, for the things that you have done. In the book of Daniel, they are speaking about presenting prayers. They say when angels are lifting baskets of prayers, going to present them before God, Baskets of requests and cryings and weepings are so many, but baskets of thanksgiving are so less. And being less, they are not even filled. So it shows people are thanking God less. You see the ten guys who were having lepros. Jesus Christ healed all of them and the nine left. Only one came back. That is about 10% of everyone, if I were to give it in that way. So I don't know how many we are here, maybe 50 or 25. And you are thinking about it. if we are 50, only five are coming back to give thanks to God. Look at how small that number is. So we need to change that and become thankful to God. And just kneel down one day, just say, Lord, I thank you. So this is a point of praying without ceasing. Never stop praying. That's one requirement for a powerful prayer. The minute you stop praying, you are, you are, you are stopping the connection. That communication you are having with, it's like a soldier that is gone to a mission. What is happening is a radio, and it has a signal to go to call the base, you know, where he's coming from. And the minute he loses connection with the base, he's going to be lost where he is. And they won't even know that he is winning or dead or what. He will be disconnected. In other means, they can even mourn for him saying he's dead. That's why if you stop praying, you end up becoming spiritually down. And people will look at you, won't know that. You are dying spiritually. They just see you going to church, coming back, coming to the sessions, holding a Bible, even a big Bible. Some hold three Bibles. Oh, here they are, they are now. Some hold three Bibles. <laughs> <laughs> and people look at you, they say, oh, that man is a prayerful man. They don't know that you don't, you don't pray. It's God who knows. That's why at the end they will say, I don't know you. They've done miracles and so forth, but I don't know you. There was, there was no connection. There was nothing that linked you with God. So that's why we need prayer. Jesus Christ everywhere. He was in trouble. He was happy. Everywhere he prayed. Even on the cross he prayed. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Interceding for them. So we, we ought to never stop praying. And another book, can we just read it quickly, is First John chapter 6. Uh, is John chapter 16. Or let's, let's start with First John chapter 5, verse 14. First John chapter 5, verse 14. I will read it in this one. So the first point is to pray without ceasing. And the second one is the one in First John chapter 5, verse 14. It says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. That we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin, a sin, okay, that's another one. So just verse 14 and 15. It is saying, if we are praying in his way. So if you are praying without ceasing and you pray outside his way, you are likely not to get what you are asking. Likely. I'm not saying you won't. You are likely not to get it. Because James is attesting to this. James chapter 4, it's chapter 4 verse 3, it says, you have been asking and you don't receive what you are asking. Because you are asking with the wrong motive. You are asking outside the will of God. So the minute you get into the will of God and you start asking him, praying without ceasing, all those things, they just come in line. And the, the question is, what is the will of God? The will of God is in the wait. It's what God has planned for your life. If God has said you are going to be a doctor and you want to be a teacher, no matter how much you will pray about being a teacher, you are likely not to succeed. Actually, the minute you pray, it seems like things don't work in teaching. The minute you fast, fail test like no one's business. Then you think maybe it's the demons or the devil. No, go back to the will of God. Ask God, what is it that I must do? Guide everything that I'm doing. Ask for signs. And the minute you stay in prayer, in the will of God, things are just going to flow you. I'll give an example with me. I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I applied, qualified, yes, but they didn't take me. They said space constraints. So I prayed very hard. <laughs> I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, nothing happened. Prayed and prayed and prayed, nothing happened. And they accepted me in teaching. But I said, okay, let me do teaching for one year. Then I'll change the next day and go back to engineering. Okay, that was a nice idea. So I went to teaching, things were just flowing in teaching. I came here, the first day I came to university, they registered, they, they, they registered me, though I was late. I think I was late by two weeks. So I kept on praying and praying and praying and praying. The next day came and in my heart I started reflecting back. I saw what God wanted for me. At first I was asking him outside his way. I was asking him in my way. My motive was for me to be an electrical engineer, have a lot of money, drive expensive cars. But God wanted me to be in front of hate, minds, brains and start to engineer them. Both spiritually and physically. I didn't know that. So he directed me and in what he directed me, when I prayed, things just opened. I'm telling you, there were times where I didn't have money at all while doing teaching. And I would just pray, and all of a sudden, money in the account. I started inquiring, what is this for? Ah, we are paying you in upfront. Wow, this is nice. They didn't know where I was. And that is the prayer that I was having in the will of God. So when we pray in the will of God, things just open. And we keep on praying in the will of God and praying and praying. And here, John is saying, if we are praying in his will, we must be confident that he hears us. And not just hearing us, he also answers us. And when he answers us, we have what we asked for. We already have it. If now I ask for a car with a good motive in his will, a car is coming. I don't care if I have a license now. A license will come also. If I ask for a house, I can have it. But the question is, is it in his will? Because perhaps his will is for me to travel the world, to never have a station at a home, but to sleep in hotels while preaching the way. And I want a house, I want a home, and I will leave it alone. So you see the difference between praying outside the will of God and praying in the will of God. So we ought to pray in his will. And then that is the second point. And the, sec the, the third one, okay, and another thing about praying in his will, how you can get his will or know his will is for you to read the will of God. That's why prayer without the will of God is dead. Because you are speaking without direction. The word of God directs you in prayer. It tells you how you should pray. When the word says, Our Father who art in heaven, that, that is teaching you how you ought to pray. David says, The Lord is my shepherd. You follow his ways, you pray. Later on, you are praying in your own ways and you continue praying and praying. And the word of God is full of promises of which when you are praying, those promises come in your life and you accept them and you become Georgia. With God, the relationship becomes fine. And if you read the word of God and you read it with different intentions than getting it in your heart, it's a waste of time. Because let's say you are reading and what you are looking for, you want the way Jesus Christ lied. 
you will find many places where you think Jesus Christ lied, but he didn't lie. So you won't have the word of God in you. You will have the verses of the scriptures, but not the word of God in you. You will have the lines, but not the meaning. That's why you will know in the beginning God created heaven and earth, but you will know what it means. How did he do that? Because you lack the weight in you. So we have to put the weight, just like God told Joshua, he said, let these ways not depart from your own eyes. Let them be on your lips. Meditate on them day and night. And when you keep on meditating, keep on meditating. The scriptures show you your sins. You pray to God. You ask for forgiveness. He forgives you. Later on, you pray for others and others are saved and so forth. That's a prayerful life. You're continuing, praying in the will of God to know that will you go to the scriptures. The question is, how can the scriptures tell you about you? Jesus Christ said, the scriptures are like a mirror when he spoke through a servant. He said, the scriptures are like, are like a mirror. When you, look into, when you look into the scriptures, you, you will end up seeing yourself. That's why at some point you are reading and you feel like they're talking about you. Or sometimes someone is preaching and you feel like, ah, this one knows my secret. How can they say this? <laughs> it's not that. It's because it, it's a mirror. When you look at it, you start seeing things you didn't see before. For example, as you are standing there, you can't see your ear. The only way you can see it is look, to look on a mirror, you will see it. So there are things you can't see unless you go to the scriptures. The minute you touch the scriptures, you start seeing, okay, this is the will of God. And if you read that uh, first Corinthians, I mean, first Thessalonians, it says this is also the will of God, that you should never stop praying. So to not stop praying is the will of God also. So if you didn't know, you will stop praying. You are outside the will of God. Okay, the third point is faith. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 22. Applying faith. Matthew 21, 22. The same thing, parallel verse is Mark chapter 20, chapter 11, verse 22. Wow, how nice, but let me not be there. Mm, anyone to read it for us? If you believe, you will get anything you ask for in you. Mm. That's a short text verse. I've never come across. <laughs> okay, let me read it also. Thank you very much. Let me read it also. It says, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer believing you shall receive and when you go to verse 21 it says jesus christ answered them and said verily i say unto you if you have faith and not doubt you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree but also if you shall say unto this mountain be thou removed and be cast into the sea it shall be done so and if you believe all these things and you're asking you shall receive so the, the main thing is faith, of which faith has been living inside. Hebrews say it is impossible to please God without faith. So how can you communicate with him without faith? And how can you communicate with him and please him? Because it says faith is the one that alerts us that there is a God up there who created the whole soil, the whole universe, the whole earth. As you touch a brick and the brick is made of soil and soil is made of minerals, God made all that from nothing. That's faith. So without that faith, there is no way we can please God. And there is no way we can have a nice conversation with Him. You bow down and already you are doubting. You say, but ah, can God heal this stomach that I'm having? Stomach ache. No, I need to drink some water and pour salt and sugar and so forth. Maybe I'll be healed. That is lack of faith. And it says you can't receive the direct healing from God through that. Through that. So this point is alerting us that in prayer we ought, to, we ought to apply faith. We ought to believe in what we are asking. So the first one is to pray without ceasing. In all the prayers you are having, you believe. And in all the prayers you are saying, you are saying them in the will of God. Having those three, and I will just add a few more, you are bound or you are going to have power in prayer. It's like if you stand in front of a train or a taxi and it's running at 120 kilometers per hour. Laws of physics will tell you, you don't have to do much. All you have to do is to stand and you will be killed. That's all you have to do. 
If you put your hand in sulfuric acid, ex- 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 expect your hand to disappear. Why? Those are the rules of physics, chemistry. So the rules of prayer is if you follow them, you don't have to do much again. Things are just going to flow. You pray continually. You don't have to sweat a lot, cutting yourself with coming blood and so forth like the prophets of Baal, trying to pray and call their God. All you have to do is to follow these principles. Pray without season, pray in the will of God and believe. Have the word of God in you. Because the word of God guides you into how you pray. The word of God alerts you of people who have prayed before and they were answered. And that increases faith. Because imagine, you have never heard of anyone praying. And there you are praying. You don't even know that there was once Stephen who prayed and his prayers were, were answered. There's no, there's, it's very impossible that you will start believing in your heart that your prayers will be answered. So you need to know about him. And the minute you know about him, when you are praying, you even alert God. You say, God, I know you have done it. You, Stephen answered, uh, asked and you answered. And the scriptures, the very scriptures I read say, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you did it back then, you can do it today. I'm giving you a funny example. You have an exam. <laughs> and that exam, in first semester, you know how we were writing. Those who were writing online, you write and then you take a picture and you send. And then you notice that ah, this exam I won't finish now. And you start applying faith, you pray, you say, let the clock stop time. If the exam is being submitted at 12, at half past 11, you are still halfway, you say, let, let the clock stop. And it's half past 11, wire, wire, until you finish writing. <laughs> it's hard to believe it, right? But it can happen. That's a real thing, no. That's why if you look at the seasons we are having now, they are very confusing. In October, it seems like it's August. In January, it seems like it's June. They are just mixed up and we are just focusing oh june july august it's this august september and so forth is this but you look at the seasons they are changing we don't know who is praying it's summer the sun is up there and there's no way that it will rain all of a sudden we don't know who was praying someone was looking for food and prayed and said lord let it rain i remember there was a time i asked google i said is there any chance of rain it said, no, it will be sunny today. That moment, I'm standing under a tree. It's raining with ice. And Google said, it's sunny today. I said, I will never trust you again. I, I believe that that day, I believe someone prayed and said, Lord, please. Because there are people who eat when it rains only. So that person prayed. There are people who eat when it is sunny only. Like people who sell tea. You can't sell tea in, in summer. At six, the sun is already blazing. People need cold drink. You can't sell cold drinks in winter. Only two people will buy. So those, those kind of prayers are the ones that are affecting the weather conditions. And we don't know. So we can also partake in those things. You see that here, I'm in danger. Pray. Apply faith. Pray in the will of God. And I'm telling you, it will happen. Another one is fearing God. In John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse 31. Mm, this one is very interesting. It's fearing God and it aligns to doing His will. Chapter, uh, John chapter 9, verse 31. It says, Okay, let me start from 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is? And yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and does his will, he hears him. Another version says, if any man fears God, God will hear him. If any man honor God, God will hear him. So all those things, worship, honor, fearing God, they are needed in power to pray. Imagine you're coming to pray before God and you don't fear him at all. There's no fear of God in you. All you do is just to come before him. It's like you're talking to that little guy at home or that neighbor's child who you hate very much. You say, hey, come here, go to the shops. So you're going to God with that motive. You say, hey, God, tomorrow I need to pass that test. Make sure that I pass it. 
Ah, yeah, yeah. We must forget. <laughs> Even though you're asking the right way, the fact that you're not fearing God, you're not going there with a sincere heart, don't expect to be answered. And don't expect to have power in prayer. That's why you will pray and pray and pray. There are people who actually are shouting at God. And I've heard some people say, you know, God, sometimes you have to shout at him. I'm not saying shout, raising the voice. They are saying shout as if you are shouting at someone who is looking at you. Hey, I say this, man. Imagine. There are people who do that. <laughs> and they expect to receive power in prayer. No, they must stop actually thinking fantasies, you know. It's a fantasy that you shout at God and expect him to answer. It can be. So we need to revere God. We need to fear him. When you go there, you must go there with, with reverence. That's why at points people kneel down when they pray. It's because they are honoring him. They are honoring him. They say, we are taking ourselves to be low, humbling ourselves. Please, Lord, let it be you only who is high. And we are placing these requirements that we are having. I mean, these requests that we are having. Please answer unto them. So this man, it's a man who Jesus Christ healed. He opened his eyes. And the court called him, they said, who opened your eyes? And he told them, I don't know that man. It's just a man who was moving around. He didn't know Jesus Christ because for sure he didn't see him before because his eyes were blind. And he might not have heard about him. But Jesus Christ came, healed the man. Because the man believed that he could be healed. And then after being healed, the man saw Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ left, went into the ground. The priest came and they said, man, you were blind before, now you see. Who made you see? said, it's a man who was healing people around. I don't know him. So they started questioning him. So he responded with this verse. He said, I know that God does not listen to sinners. But if a sinner, and he's saying, if anyone will revere God, will fear God, will worship God, God will hear that person. So for you to get into the connection in that conversation, you need to fear God. Because if you're going there fearless you know, of God, it's very likely that. And someone is asking, what does this man mean when he says, God will not hear the prayer of sinners? Go to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15. God is saying, even though you raise your hand, and you shout a lot, you cry, he says, I will not see you because your hands are full of blood. That's a, a definition of a sinner. And a sinner is someone who disobeys God. And you ask yourself, how does blood land on someone's hand? Is it by killing? Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 is explaining that a little bit. It says, if I tell you to go and do something and you don't do it, I tell you to go and tell a person that what they are doing is wrong and they should stop and you don't do it. It says the person will die in their own sins and their blood will be in your hands even though you have never touched them. And later on, you are trying to pray to God because you never listened to him. How can he look at you? How can he look at you and say, my child is praying, let me listen. But the minute you start fearing him, even though you have done those bad things, he will hear you. That is what this man is saying. So you need to fear God. That's one of the requirements for a powerful prayer or to receive power in prayer. And also you need to live in God's presence. I won't read this verse because of time. It's Psalms 91. It says, those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High, Start counting all the blessings. And the blessings are protection, provision, and so forth. For you to receive all those things, when you speak God's lessons, you need to live in Him. You need to make Him to be your habitation. When you are scared, you go to Him. When you are happy, you go to Him. Paul is speaking to a church, he says, when you are happy, sing psalms and hymns and dance together. When one is sick, weep with them. So we need to go to God every time, live in Him. And when we are in Him, we live in Him through prayer. Every time we are praying without ceasing. So all those points are connecting. You need to be in Him, pray without ceasing in Him. Because someone will say, I'm in God, while going to church every day, and they don't pray. They are lying, they are in church, not in God. So you need to be in God through prayer. So you need to be in God, need to be prayerful without ceasing. Need to pray in His will, need to believe when you pray. And you need to be filled with his weight. Few more other is that you need to pray in Jesus Christ's name. There are many people who are just praying and they don't mention Christ. It's unlikely that God will answer you when you don't mention him. Why? Let's go to John 14 verse 14.
John 14, verse 14. It says, I will start it from 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus Christ is saying, he himself, he will do it. And if you check it, Jesus Christ, in this generation we are in. Okay, let me not go there, it's fine. If we ask in his name, he is going to answer us. Even when, when we gather in his name, there he is. We don't have to invite him. I know there are times where we are inviting him. We say, oh, Holy Spirit, we are inviting you. That's okay, that's okay. I won't condemn that. Sometimes they say, Jesus Christ will invite you. But he promised. They said, when you gather in my name, without saying anything, there he is. The only thing you can do is to say, please, God, intervene. Because there are times he can be there but not intervene. Just be there. You read Malachi chapter 3, it says, two men were walking, talking about Christ, and he had them, talking about God to say. And he had them, and he recorded down what they were saying. They were talking about him, and he came. He didn't say anything, he just had them, and he recorded down. So there are times where you speak, and you are together, you have gathered, and you have no idea that Christ is among you. At times, he intervenes. See, things happen which are unusual. <clears throat> and also, John 16, it speaks of the same thing. John 16, verse 24. It says, Here to have you asked anything, uh, here to have ye asked nothing in my name, ask, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time comes when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Okay. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Okay. He just mentioned that when we pray in his name, praying in Jesus Christ's name. When we pray in his name, the prayer becomes very, it's like we are aiding salt and bullet spies and all those things which are nice into the meat, you know. And it becomes so nice. The bullet spy is the six gun. <laughs> I named it bullet spies. <laughs> when we are, we, are, we are praying in Christ's name, we are aiding those things in, in that prayer. And this man, everything of that prayer becomes nice. Even when it reaches God's ears, when he hears his word inside, his name, the name of Jesus Christ, the prayer becomes so interesting. But imagine you're just praying all along, three hours, without mentioning the name of Christ. Then you say, Amen. Who are you praying to? So to receive power in prayer, because power is given by Christ, we need to mention him. We need to call him. Have faith in him. Another requirement is to have correct intentions when we are coming to pray. I, there is a quote some people say, they say, which is pray to God also and God answers them. That's a total lie. Big lie. The biggest lie I've ever heard. They say witches, like, sometimes they're saying, I pray to God, they say, ah, even witches pray to God and he answers. Ah. <laughs> That's a total lie. God does not answer to evil intentions. He doesn't. Because witches, all they wish is evil. They say, oh, God, please, break his leg. Hey, what? Can God just break your leg out of nowhere? Unless God has a point in that. Just like the devil, you remember in the book of Job. Job came. He said, I mean, uh, the devil came. He said to God, Job, you have given him so much. That's why he honors you. Take it away and you will see. And it is God who allowed him. He said, take it away, but don't touch his soul. And in all that, Job's faith was being increased. So those are the temptations which God allowed. But not that when the devil was praying that, please, let Job be in my hands, that God will answer. No. It's because God had a purpose in Job. He knew what he wanted to produce more in him. He had faith. He needed to increase it. That's why at the end he said, why are you talking so much when you know so little? Starting to teach him even more. So through, if the devil didn't do all those things, Job was not going to know the things that God was going to say. So the thing that says, which is also pray and God answers, ah, it's another God, it's not the God I know, not Jesus Christ. Can't be him. 
So when we pray, we ought to pray with correct intentions. Don't pray for cases. Don't pray for cases to be reversed to back to the sender. Please, I, I beg you. I beg you. I beg you. If someone hits you with a clap, don't pray that the clap goes back to them. Please. Stephen didn't say, please God, stone these people because they are stoning me. Jesus Christ didn't say, crucify these people. He said, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. So we need to have good intentions. And don't pray with a grudge because you are likely to say bad things. And it is said that when a man of God prays or a woman of God prays, even if they are praying a bad thing towards someone, that, that prayer can be answered. You look at Elisha. After receiving in 2 Kings chapter 2, after receiving the mantle and the, the garment from Elijah, he went on, he parted the river of Jordan, dry ground was left, he passed. After passing 42 children mocking him, bald head, bald head, bald head, there is no hair on top of your head. And he got angry. Though he didn't pray to God directly, but he spoke words. He said, you will not reach your homes. That's all. And they didn't reach their homes. So don't pray while angry, please. When you are angry, sing psalms and become calm and then pray. Because you are likely to curse someone and it's not good. <laughs> Imagine if Paul was cursed by Christians of that time, when he was still sound. Going on and killing people, we were, not, we were never going to hear of Paul. He was going to remain sound who is cursed. So I believe some of the Christians prayed for him. They said, please, Lord, that man, the way he is, please convert him. Let him believe, and God converted him. Though it's not recorded, I believe that. Another one is to pray in spirit, which is the prayer in tongues. That one is a topic on its own. Prayer in spirit. Let's just read the, its verse, because I think it's important more. Romans 8, verse 26. The book of Romans. So he is just mentioning the prayer in the spirit. You know. there, there, there are two meanings of it. The first meaning is you are not praying just physically, but you connect spiritually and start praying. And the second one is you have the Holy Spirit in you and he helps you in prayer. So those are two types of the prayer in the spirit. So when the Holy Spirit helps you in prayer, it's when you start praying in tongues at times. You don't understand what you are saying. You go to John 14, I mean, uh, yes, it's 1 Corinthians 14. Paul is saying, when you're praying in, the, in tongues, you don't understand yourself. Bring one person who prays in tongues and they hear very well what they're saying without the gift of interpretation of tongues. There is none. You have no idea. You're just saying, wala, 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 wala. And you don't make sense to your own self. But in the spirit, you are making a lot of sense. Why? The Holy Spirit is helping you, interceding for you. And it says, the one who searches the hearts, knows the mind of the spirit and if the spirit itself is giving you the meaning of that prayer god himself is getting that meaning from the mind of the holy spirit and you just see things happening there are times i just pray in tongues and good things just happen i didn't ask for them i don't know of them maybe i was asking in prayer and i didn't know and some people will tell you for you to pray longer sometimes you need to pray in tongues at times, at times, you need to pray in tongues. You, there's a, there's a very big chance for you to pray longer. But that's not the competition we are having. I had one brother saying, hey, if, if, you, if, you, <laughs> if you are 21 years old and above, and you have never prayed in tongues for six hours without stopping, your life is a joke. I said, ah, it can't be. Because this is not a competition. Jesus Christ never said, please, make sure that you reach six hours or seven hours. As long as the prayer has meaning, you are 
bound to have power in that prayer. You pray for healing to happen. There it is. What? Okay, because of time, see, time is always running after me. Another thing is to is, is repentance, for you to have power in prayer. If you're going before God and you haven't repented of previous sins, they are likely to, to be a barrier in your prayer. That's why Daniel, in chapter 9, before he started praying for his families and his people and all that, he asked for forgiveness of their sins first. He repented of everything that he was doing. He said, please, Lord, help them, forgive them. Because repentance leads to forgiveness of sins. That's why John, when he got out of the wilderness, the first thing he said, he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and then you shall receive. Adding on Peter what he said. So repentance is very important. What is repentance? Is to turn away from your sin and start to hate that sin. If you have been doing a certain sin which you yourself don't like, turn away from it and hate it even more. If you liked it, turn away from it and start hating it. That's a repentance. Because if you are doing what you hate, you are not likely to continue doing it. It's like writing of homeworks. Students at school, they hate homeworks. That's why if you never check homeworks from January to December, you are likely to find the book only two pages written. Likely. Because they can't do what they don't like. So the minute you hate sin, it is likely that you will leave it. If you start hating smoking, God will help you to leave it. So repentance is needed when you get to prayer. And another thing is setting a target in prayer. Don't just pray without any straight direction. Just getting in prayer. Amen. Nah. Need to have one direction. Jesus Christ, when he was praying in the Mount of Ada's uh, Gethsemane, where he said, pray so that you do not be tempted. The scriptures say he went further, he prayed. He said, Lord, if this cup, it was possible that it should pass, let it pass, but let your will be done. He got up, he went back. He came back, he prayed the same prayer. So he had a target in prayer. So when you are coming to pray and you have no target, like you are kneeling down and there's nothing in your mind, an idea of why you are praying on that evening, you are unlikely to receive power. You think weight will just come during prayer. So you need to have a target. There are times where you say, okay, tomorrow I'm writing. Let me pray about it today. You kneel down, you are praying about writing. And you pray and you pray. Later on, you remember another thing you pray. At night you are sleeping, you dream of someone dying or someone being shot. You stand up, you kneel down. The target is what? To intercede for that person. You have a target. Then that is power in prayer. You are going to receive that power. You want to pray for 80%. There you are. Pray about it. And what we do at the end of the sessions, we are having targets. We start with this one. And another thing I can show you, when I say let's, let's have prayer requests, and we have over 50 prayer requests, it is very unlikely that one of you will pray in all the 50. But our brother here will pick three. Our brother there will pick another three. At the end of the day, we have covered the entire 50. Each of us had a target. That's how it is. Or is there anyone who prays all the prayer points we have? <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong. It's right. But it's likely that when you are praying, you focus on one thing. One thing that touched your heart. You know? Maybe I prayed for business and it touched your heart, but it didn't touch the next person. And you focus on business, you start praying on it. The next person was touched by thanksgiving. They start thank thanking God more and more. At the end of the day, we had targets. So we need targets in prayer. Just like someone who has a gun or has an, an archer. They call it an archer. Eh? Not archer, you will hear that thing that you pull and <laughs> you leave it and it goes with a with an air, ding! You can't just pull that thing without knowing where you're going to point. If you just pull it going anywhere, you won't receive anything. There is no goal that you are, you are having, therefore don't, don't, don't expect any results which are actually successful. But the minute you say, I want to hit that light, you have a target and you start pointing. Wah! The first time you might miss, you go again. Wow, you hit it. That is what we need in prayer. You know, to have a target. And we see that in Matthew 6 verse 8, but I won't read it. And also fasting. Fasting I mentioned it yesterday, but I want to mention it again. Uh, the book of 
the same book I quoted yesterday, Matthew 17, 21, it says, this cannot go out unless by prayer and fasting. So for you to have a powerful prayer or have power in, in, in prayer, you need to spice it with fasting. Put some fasting inside. You are praying about something without fasting. Every time you are praying, the stomach is full and drunk and ate and so forth. I'm not saying you, you will not be answered when you pray with a full stomach. Ah. <laughs> you will be. But there are times where you will not. Because there's a higher authority needed and there's something deeper needed. And you need to fo focus on the spirit and forget the flesh. And then you start fasting and engaging and engaging in prayer. And you see, you see things that, like generational cases. Some you can just speak, you know, they are broken. Some you need fasting. Without fasting, they won't be broken. You see, every time, at this time, this happens. Like the, the spirit of death. Every time in June, in your family, there is a burial. Every time in June, for 10 years. That's shocking. You need fasting and prayer. Pray and you see, the next June, nothing will happen. Because even the family will be scared. When it's approaching June, they're asking themselves, who is next? <laughs> and all of them are in the house. They don't want to take a ticks because they know. <laughs> they're in the house. Even though they're in the house, sleeping on bed, one tomorrow wakes up, they're dead. Now that's a family case. So you can stop that through prayer and fasting. And who can receive power in prayer? The person who can receive it is anyone who meets these requirements. Anyone. Whether you are born again or you are not, anyone, depending on what we mean by born again. So anyone can receive, even you seated there, even me standing here, you can receive that power in prayer. And the question is, what do we mean by power in prayer? We are speaking about supernatural things happening around. What we call miracles, true miracles from God. What happened there is backed up by a prayerful lifestyle. If you're praying, you reach a point, things happen. You were praying and you get to an exam, you just answer two questions. And then you faint, maybe, let's say. <laughs> then later on, you find that the two questions you wrote, they are the only ones which are wrong. The rest are right and you didn't write them. Yes. And you're surprised. How is that possible? You are having a prayerful life. I'm telling you, when you have a prayerful life, things just open. They go in a straight line. A straight line curve, you know. <laughs> Things are straightened up. You know. So we need that prayerful life. We need to meet these requirements. Follow all of them. And I promise you, with all my heart and with the word of God, if you follow these requirements, they are not all, but if you follow these requirements for a powerful prayer or power in prayer, you will have it. You will have that power. I'll just call them again without mentioning much more about them. Just to tell you how they link together. And how is it is you reach a place, you haven't asked for something. And already there it is, answered. Why the Holy Spirit knew your heart and God read the mind of the Holy Spirit and God answers. At times you haven't even prayed about it. At times you start praying and an answer is already on the way. So we need that prayer for life. And it has happened with me a lot of times. I reach a place, things just open. I'll tell you another example which happened recently. Yeah, recently. You know, it was very hard for me to get a lot of finances and peace up and so forth. Because of that July matter, I need to fast for it also. So what happened is, I went to practicals, I came back. After coming back, I'm thinking now, just came back recently. I'm thinking, how am I going to get more funds, you know? How am I going to get money? And then I had a friend of mine who were working at a certain tutoring company. After practical, he called them, he said, please, I want my job back. They said, ah. They didn't even respond to his messages. They kept quiet. Shh. When I came back, a week later, yesterday, today's Tuesday, yeah, yesterday, in the morning, imagine, they are calling me. And I didn't even ask for the job back. I was even thinking I should leave it because the year is already over. They are closing soon. You know. They are calling me. They say, man, do you still want your job back? I say, which job? They say, the tutoring. I said, yes. When can I start? They say, today. Oh. And I was having an exam yesterday. I said, okay, it's fine. I will come. I went, I came back. I wrote the exam and submitted. All is well. I tried checking the prayer for life I used to have. 
That guy even now is still looking for that job. He can't get it. Telling them, telling them, he doesn't get it. So what did prayer do? It opened things. Things just happened. You're looking, brother, how was it says, I'm praying that next year I have, a, I have a proper job, you know, job provision. Have a prayerful life now. <laughs> and you'll be surprised next year on the 1st of January, you are, you are receiving a call from one of the best paying companies. They are calling you by say name. Hey, mister, is it you? Is it you? Is this you? Say yes. <laughs> and they give you a job. That's because of a prayerful life. And the miracles that happened, we are talking about the power over the fruits that we are toiling about, the work that we are having. You are waking and you don't see any fruits. Pray. You'll receive power by seeing the fruit multiply. You are simply praying and praying and praying and things are just adding on the work you are doing. The only simple thing you do is to go to work, come back. Pray, pray, preach where you can. Go to work, come back. At the end of the day, you see yourself buying a lot of things. You check the balances even over your salary. You are surprised how? It is because of the prayer you are having. So when you are praying, when you are having a prayerful life, a prayerful lifestyle, you don't need to look for miracles. You yourself live a miracle life. Things happen in your life. People are amazed. They say, ha, ha, how did he do that? And you are not even surprised. Like Peter, when he walked and the shade was healing people, he didn't go back and say, ha, 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 where is the video to take pictures of this? Ha, what is happening here? That was his lifestyle. He was used to it because he was spending more power, more time in prayer and connecting to God even more, reading his word and so forth. So you are able to have power over the fruits of your toil. If you are budgeting for something this month, you can pray that you receive it. Even though it's above your salary or above your stipend. You also have prayer, you have power over natural principles. You can have power over gravity in prayer. Jesus Christ disobeyed gravity. He didn't disobey as such, but he demarcated gravity. <laughs> gravity was no way to be. <laughs> gravity, was... <laughs> gravity was no way to be found. <laughs> gravity was no way to be found. He ascended up. You, you look at when he entered the wall without actually opening the door and the windows. That's disobeying the laws of nature. So when you become more prayerful and more prayerful and more, more prayerful, you don't need extraordinary measures. All you have to do is to become prayerful and you will see things happening. Look at Elijah. Elijah was a prayerful man. God told him there will be a famine here, run away. When he ran on the road, he didn't have food. Birds came to give him food, breakfast and dinner. Birds. And that was not amazing to him. That was a usual thing. If someone from outside was saying, oh, oh, this man is, is, is a witch. He is using moti disorder. How can birds come and give him food? Ravens were coming, they brought meat. Imagine ravens eat meat and they brought meat. Which was so fresh. Of where it was coming from, I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell. Maybe the bird was just flying and meat just appeared in the mouth. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell that. But when you are having a prayerful life, you become you have more authority, you have more power, and you start to disobey the laws of nature. Look at Jesus Christ. There's a law in chemistry. There's a law of the conversation of mass. Not conversation, the conservation. The conservation of mass. <laughs> There's a law of conservation of mass. What it says is, if you're having a cup, and you close it, you put two, two milliliters of water, two milliliters of another substance, they will react. After the reaction have ended, it says, at the end of the day, the initial 2 milliliter and the 2 milliliter, they made 4 milliliters. They will remain 4 milliliters at the end of the day. So what it means is mass does not increase, does not decrease on its own in a closed system. The reason a person becomes big in the body is because they eat a lot of atoms. And they start adding the atoms in their bodies and they become big. So Jesus Christ disobeyed that. He took two, two, uh, five breads, two fish, raised them up, the mass increased. This never happened before. So when you are having a prayerful life, you start to have power and authority and you disobey those things. And they don't surprise you. If they surprise, they surprise you, that's, that means you are starting to have those things. You know. Now if I pray for 80%, I, I, won't, I won't even get surprised. I know 80% is coming. <laughs> Think 80% landed. And I relax. This year I prayed for only one distinction. I know I will get it. 
I don't want many. <laughs> I don't want many. It's coming. I know that. <laughs> mm, no, I don't want people to feel pressured. <laughs> I am thinking for <laughs> And you can also have you have power over time, power over speed. You look at Philip. Philip metamorphosed from Gaza to uh, another place which is seven miles away. In split seconds. There he was. So you can disobey speed. You can disobey you look at Elijah. It was Elijah who ran and, and ran faster than a horse. Ah. That's more than <laughs> if you could put him like naturally like this without a prayerful man, he was gonna just run normally. But on that time he ran faster than a horse. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the Mantarabola horses, uh, talking about stallions. And also you can have uh, authority and power over energy. We see it with Moses, you know. Moses traveled so much, even Jacob. Moses is a better example. Traveled so much from Egypt until the land where he was near the Mount Sinai. When he got there, he was so tired. So tired, he didn't have energy in him. But when he found the shepherds traveling, some daughters, energy just came from nowhere. And what does the, 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 the laws of energy say? You can't create energy, you can't destroy it. But in the land of God, that is that is foreign. We don't know that. Jesus Christ still had the energy to walk after 40 days and 40 nights without eating. What will physics tell you? After three days, you will start to not have energy if you don't eat. And after 10 days, you are likely to die. Jesus Christ fourpled that, quadrupled it. Moses just had energy from nowhere, fought with many people alone, having not eaten for a long journey. He fought and they all ran away. So the energy, you can actually disobey the rules of energy. We are talking about electricity. Ah, there are a lot of things that have happened. I can't say them because of time. There is no electricity at home and you pray, say, Lord, please, we don't have electricity and we don't have money. Please provide. And the units just stand there as they are. It has happened. I know, I know it has happened in my home. For about three years or some, the units were not moving, we're not buying electricity. <laughs> I don't wanna lie. <laughs> I don't wanna lie. <laughs> because of time, I won't go far into that. <laughs> but I'm just showing you the highlight. Don't think I'm just saying it from the scriptures and from the knowledge. I am a living piece of evidence. Things that happen on the road, they are so wonderful. Just pray, things happen. You remember the lady, the widow, in the book of uh, Kings. The widow who didn't have food, was having the last piece of pap and the last, uh, the last liters of oil. That lady was off so hard and she prayed. And God answered by telling Elijah, he said, go to a widow. She stays in this place. When he got there, Elijah said, please make food and give me. That, that lady, it says, when Elijah found her, she was collecting some woods to go and make the last meal and that she will die. Because she didn't have a job. She didn't have any means of coming to bring more food. So what happened? Elijah said, even the little you have, please share with me. The lady shared and the scriptures say, Elijah said to her, go and bring more drums and put them here. And those drums, they were having oil. Even though they, the lady took every day, she took a cup from that oil, it was like here. She took it, became here. Tomorrow she wakes up, she's back there. That disobeys all laws of physics, all laws of chemistry. Maybe if someone at night was coming to pour, <laughs> but that's not what the scriptures say. So it can happen. Even today, you are praying that your account stays where it is. You go. <laughs> It can happen, like for, for real, for real, 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 real. Try it. If you want to try it, man, try it. You go and it's 1.5 open as far as you go, so I point. Later on, you check, it's still 1.5. Ah, maybe I was having extra. Go, wing, still 1.5. It can happen. 
The question is, if you're asking yourself how, you are still focusing on the laws of nature. Get out of them and go to God. In God, there is no miracle because all things are normal to him. Him creating soil from nothing is normal. For us, it's very unusual. Imagine, this pocket has nothing. I show you there's nothing. I put it back and when I bring it out, there's a lot of money. We're asking ourselves, where is it coming from? That's disobeying the laws of nature. <laughs> okay, today I'm taking more time than I'm supposed to. Also, you have what? Power over spiritual realities. Both in, on, on earth, under the earth, and above, above the earth. You remember the book we read yesterday? It says you have authority. You are about to subdue the skies, the earth, and the things in the sea. As we know that everything is made spiritual before it manifests in the flesh, you have authority in the spiritual realm also. That's why you can speak to a demon and it lives, but only in the name of Jesus Christ. So you do have those that authority over curses. Without saying much, you can just say to a curse, be broken and it can be broken. You can lift up a curse, you can lift up sicknesses. Those are spiritual things and you have power over those things. Only when you are having a prayer for life. Uh, meeting all those requirements, the spells, the traps, the spiritual traps. When I'm praying and I'm going to a dangerous place, I pray that, Lord, please, let me be safe. And while I'm on the road, I'm having faith that I'm going to be safe. I'm telling you an example. I was coming from Tembisa, I think it was last week, ne? Not last week? Yeah, last week, just when I came from practicals. Just outside ShopRite, around 7, before I came to the session here, it was on a Sunday. We were having a prayer with Prada Hotats, if I remember well, at 8, if you remember that one. So as I was coming, passing by, like it was like here. I don't know what happened, I just had two gunshots. Two people were shot. I see one guy running with one leg. Yes. <laughs> and I asked myself, I said, I don't know where that gun came from. What if it came to me? But in my mind, in my heart, I knew God protects me. Even if it came, that bullet was going to bend. And continue. <laughs> I'm not lying. Okay, the targets you are having, eh? or the requirements. The first one is to pray without ceasing. Second one, pray in the will of God. Third one, pray with belief and faith. Fourth one, fear God and worship him. Sixth one, a fifth one, is living in God's presence. Dwelling in him. Sixth one is praying in Jesus' name. Seven is correct intentions, having the right motive. The eighth one is praying in the spirit, both in tongues and praying, connecting in the spirit. The eighth one is repentance. The ninth one is setting a target in prayer. And the tenth one here is fasting. There are many more, maybe 27, 30, and so forth. The principles that are needed to be followed in prayer. And it helps a lot. So I think that will be it because time is fast spent so we can just stand up and close